Whoa, whoa, whoa. He leave. Yeah, uh, what's up? Didn't you say you were gonna post a devlog, like, six months ago? Oh, uh, oops. Uh, yeah, I should do that. Hello there. Leaf here with another devlog for you guys. Number two. I did not mean to take this long between making video devlogs, but the good news is I've got quite a bit of content to show for it. So much so that I might have to break this video up into pieces, but we'll see how recording and editing goes. Let's start off with showing the details of the NPCs, uh, like the movement controllers, utility AI, and stats nodes that I put into these guys. And perhaps to save myself some time, I'll use uh, one of the AIs that everybody's been talking about. I found this one in an old computer that I may or may not have stolen from an abandoned warehouse, and I think I got it working on my computer. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so let's see if we can pull up the move controller. Open. Uh, Dungeon Survive is the name of my project. Uh, movement controller. I don't know. It's an AI. I could probably figure it out. Processing requests. Calculating requirements. Root drive. Back kernel. Whoa. Hold on. Hold on there. Stop. Stop. Stop it now. Oh, dear. Okay, so obviously that wasn't a real AI, it was just an animation that I made as sort of a tribute to an old RTS game that I played as a kid. It was military themed, and I believe the first one came out in 95. If anyone can guess it correctly, I will highlight the first comment that gets it. I made this animation in Godot because I found my computer uh, couldn't handle the video editor once the animation got complex enough with a lot of moving parts. So Godot ended up being a really good tool for this. Uh, there were only a few oddities with the animations seemingly keeping some keys that I had deleted, but otherwise it worked really well. And I did find that uh, something I didn't know before, an animation player can actually call animations from other animation players. And I'm really curious how deep you can go with that sort of nesting. Just animations calling animations calling, calling animations, animations calling, calling animations, animations calling animations. And just probably crash. Good though. <laughs> A quick note before I proceed. I've had people ask me about how I have custom icons in my editor for my various NPCs. Uh, nodes and such, and it's actually really simple to implement in Godot. You just need this line at icon with the path to your SVG file of the icon that you want to use, and then that node needs to be defined as a custom class, like I have here my animation controller. Uh, to create SVG files, you just need a editor that can save SVG files, such as I use a sprite just because I like the program and I like pixel art. So I use a sprite which can export directly as an SVG file. You can also use free and open source software such as Inkscape. Um, another note is to use something such as SVG Cleaner to make those files smaller just to help the editor along. I do not believe it's super necessary as long as your files aren't super huge, but I have been told it helps. Okay, getting back on track, I do actually want to talk about the nodes that make up my NPCs. Each NPC consists of an animation controller, stats node, movement controller, target tracker, dialogue controller, and utility AI. Out of all the nodes that make up the NPCs, only the animation controller requires its children to be edited directly, and that's because the children can vary greatly between 
the different NPCs with the simplest requiring just an animation player and a sprite 2D and a sprite sheet, whereas other NPCs might require multiple different sprites or even uh, in this case with the fire skull, he's got a point light that I added to him, or a couple of them rather. And the spider um, uses a sub viewport with two separate sprite 2Ds so that his eyes can glow in the dark. The final reason is that the animation player has to be edited directly each time. At its core, the animation controller is my version of the animation tree that Godot has built in already. It receives signals from other nodes to determine what animation to play and which direction to play it, perhaps running up or uh, running left, depending on what the movement controller is telling it to do, and uh, then updates whatever it needs to via the animation player. An important concept to me though when building my animation controller is that things like sight tracking cones or hurt boxes and hit boxes need to follow what the player is seeing on the screen. In this case, if my mouse is running to the left, his hurt box should reflect that if it's going to change between running left and perhaps running up or down. And so the animation controller emits a signal to all of the other nodes here to let it know what direction that it's playing that animation in. That way, if there's any sort of weird bug or disconnect like I've had in the past where the mouse was running backwards for a brief period of time, his hurt box and hit box and things of that nature would follow what the animation is actually playing. That way there wasn't some strange disconnect where the player would see the mouse facing left, but his hitbox was facing right. Now let's get to the heart of the NPCs, the stats node. So as I stated earlier, the children of the stats node don't get edited directly, but I do still need to change things like their origin, size, shape, etc. And so that's when I use my component visualizer. All it does is take in a standardized version of the component's inputs, in this case the uh, stats inputs, and can display them because it's a tool script in either the editor or in the game. So here I can see my hurt box, I can change its color to make it more visible, and anything else I need to do. Now I hear you asking me, Leaf, why do you not want to edit the children directly? It's pretty easy, it's just a single checkbox and you're doing it for the animation controller. And I would reply to you, I'm not taking questions at this time. Thank you. But also, in casual fashion, I would mention that my stats node's structure does not need to change drastically between NPCs. Every NPC needs a hurt box and a sight sound profile. So I don't need to add things necessarily except for in edge cases. Now if I do want to disable the hurt box or the sight profile or sound profile, I could just click the shape active boolean off and disable it that way. The hurt box area is simply an area 2D that sends a signal to the stats node when a hit box overlaps with it and then the stats node will go through some calculations to determine if damage can be applied and what damage to apply whereas the sight and sound profiles are just area 2Ds that sit on top of the stats node that are then uh, tracked by the target tracker, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute. And finally, the stats node's inputs are the maximum health of the creature, as well as some damage reduction dictionaries, things like immunity booleans or divider numbers that the stats node uses to calculate incoming damage. I haven't done a ton of optimization to my combat system yet, but for obvious things like the Fire Skull's immunity to fire and necrotic damage, or his vulnerability to bludgeoning and resistance to cold damage, that's just kind of basic things that I've thrown in there. Once I get some more playtesting done, then I will either remove these entirely based on the concept of the game, or tweak them as necessary. Moving on to the movement controller, I would say that this node is probably the easiest to describe, but one of the more complicated nodes that the NPCs use. Boiled down, the move controller simply tells the NPC how to move. Simple, right? But under that is a lot of hidden complexity. 
The Move controller takes in commands via segments and containers. These instructions tell the Move controller how and when to move, when the controller should exit from any given segment, and if that instruction is required to be completed or can be exited at any time a new instruction is given. The Move controller then has to parse out these instructions, determine the correct way to implement them, and verify each one as they are started and completed. This allows for things like the actions of the utility AI to bundle instructions to send to the move controller once rather than the move controller having to communicate rapidly back and forth between these actions each time it completes what it needed to do at the time. So the attack action for a spider can tell the move controller that the spider needs to jump forward at a certain velocity and then stop at a certain time or if it's moved a far enough distance and then reset, all in one instruction. To round it out, this controller also houses some logic for things like checking charging collisions with walls and when to change navigation layers based on the move commands. In the future, if I have some time and it's necessary, I'm probably going to get rid of these raycasts. They were created as a sort of band-aid solution to detect when NPCs were bumping into walls and gently push them around those corners. I believe a more robust system would be the creation of multiple variations of navigation layers tailored to the different sizes of NPCs, not just the navigation layers tailored to the movement type like ground or flying. We'll see if my current system needs to be changed. Ultimately, it's working okay right now. So, The target tracker mostly does what it says it does. It keeps track of targets. The sight and sound trackers are simply area 2Ds that have masks for the sound and sight shapes. It also keeps track of the target's previous positions in case nodes need to perform actions related to where the target was. And finally, it will project raycasts to check if a target has gone behind a barrier such as a wall. And that about does it for the target tracker. Okay, let's move on to the dialog controller. Yeah, so I have some ways to create dialog and put it over NPCs or objects or anywhere on the screen via an overlay, but I have yet to include it in the actual NPCs, so that, uh, that controller is a placeholder. Okay, so recorded those lines, what's next? All right, let's bring this over. And this is where I'd put a trophy. If I had one! Yeah. I'm sure I'll get to it eventually, or I won't, I don't know. And on to the final node of the NPCs, the Utility AI. The Utility AI initializes and houses all of the actions that the NPCs can take, as well as runs through their Utility AI functions to determine what action an NPC should take at any given time. It connects the actions to whatever nodes they need to be connected to, such as the target tracker for the attack action, so that the attack action knows what targets are available. The actions themselves have their own inputs, such as for loitering, it has a minimum and maximum time for the loiter, same with the wander. And the wander also has a shape associated with it. I chose to keep the action scripts separate from the UAI script so that the UAI script didn't get too big and bloated, and that also allows the actions to be individually added and removed from each NPC. So the mouse here is pretty simple. It just has these three actions, loiter, wander, and death, whereas the fire skull has, you know, a lot more. It can chase uh, enemies and attack them and it also can move around based on other inputs. There you have it, my NPCs in a nutshell. Thank you very much for watching. If you have ideas for future videos or tutorials, please let me know. I'm happy to do a deep dive into anything people find interesting or fun. See you next time.